Hi everyone, um, this is Ellie Beamer with Environment Virginia Research and Policy Center. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna give it just one more minute to um, give people an opportunity to get on and then we'll get started. All right, um, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Again, my name is Ellie Beamer. I'm the State Director of Environment Virginia Research and Policy Center. Um, thanks so much for getting on the call with us today um, to talk about our new report on how Virginia can get to zero carbon transportation. I hope that you know, everyone is staying safe and healthy um, right now. While things might be kind of different for a little bit, I definitely am grateful that we're still able to come together to share solutions and talk about opportunities um, on issues like this. Um, so I'm joined today um, by Chris Bass with the Department of Environmental Quality, Danny Pyre of the Virginia Transit Association, Stuart Schwartz, um, the Coalition for Smarter Growth, and Jay Fassett, former chair of the Arlington County Board. Um, so let me first start by making a few remarks and giving an overview of the findings in our report. And then I will turn it over to the speakers to talk about different transportation solutions for Virginia. So we will um, take any questions that people have at the end. Um, for those of you that are on the webinar, you can, um, you can use the chat button um, down at the bottom. Um, please direct them either to the group or Ellie Reynolds, who is our Clean Cars Associate, who will be facilitating our Q&A at the end. Um, if you've called in, you can text your questions to Ellie. Her number is 603-266-8425. Um, and I'll say that again before we launch into the Q&A section, so um, if you weren't able to write that down just then. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us to talk about this today. Um, the 2020 Virginia General Assembly um, passed the Virginia Economy Act, which was a historic piece of policy that makes Virginia just the seventh state to commit to zero carbon electricity by mid-century. And now that we've been able to push across that finish line, there's a serious need and opportunity to address climate impacts associated with how we get around. The transportation sector is the largest source of global warming pollution in Virginia at 45.6%. And the earth just had its hottest January ever recorded and it's predicted 2020 will rank among the five warmest years on record. And in Virginia, we're seeing the impacts of climate change um, from rising sea levels on our coastline to extreme drought um, that we saw in parts of central Virginia last summer. Tailpipe pollution is contributing to the climate crisis and it threatens our health, increasing our risk of premature death, asthma attacks, heart disease, and plenty more. So why are emissions so high? Um, well, first, we drive a lot. Um, most Americans drive more than 10,000 miles a year, most often in inefficient fossil fuel powered vehicles. And this is definitely because our communities are built in a way, they're designed in a way that breeds car dependence. So transit is often poor quality or inconvenient or sometimes more expensive. Um, and that's if it even exists at all. Our communities were definitely built for cars, and this has resulted in the fact that walking and biking um, is oftentimes difficult or unsafe. 
With the lack of investment in transit or walking and bike friendly infrastructure, many people are left with few alternatives when it comes to transportation. Lastly, driving is heavily subsidized, making it not only the easiest option for a lot of people, but oftentimes it's the cheapest. So the only way we can effectively address global warming is by changing the way we get around and addressing these reasons that emissions are so high. We need big, ambitious goals to transform transportation and, that, and the means to achieve them. In our report um, that we're releasing, um, Destination Zero Carbon, three strategies to transform transportation, we lay out three goals that will help us solve this problem and get us closer to zero carbon transportation. So our first goal is ensuring that all vehicles sold after 2035 are electric. Given that many Virginians rely on a car to get around, this transformation is essential. And to get it right, we need both incentives and infrastructure to make it easier for folks to get around in an electric car. The second goal um, is electrifying all transit and school buses by 2030. Electrifying all modes of public transportation will eventually mean our travel can be powered by clean, renewable energy. Electrifying buses would also eliminate harmful street level emissions from diesel combustion, benefiting the health of children who board the bus to school every day and anyone who rides a bus. And then um, our third goal is doubling down the number of people who travel by walking, biking, and public transit by 2030. The least polluting car, I think we all know, is the car that we don't drive in the first place. Um, we have to provide more options so that people can choose to travel by foot, bike, or transit. Creating sustainable communities requires making zero carbon modes of travel the cheapest, easiest, most comfortable and the safest option available. Um, so Virginia's transportation system is definitely due for an upgrade if we're gonna achieve these things. Um, with clean electric cars and buses and safe streets for walking and biking, we can take a bite out of Virginia's contribution to global warming, but how can we get there? Um, this report shows how it can be done. Here's um, some of the things that we could do in Virginia to put us on this path. So in order to transform transportation across the Commonwealth, we'll need leadership at every level of government in order to make biking, walking, and public transit the most enjoyable and safest options. Every locality should put in place policies that encourage low carbon transportation. Complete street policies and investing in transit improvements are two successful approaches to this. The more we invest and improve transit, the more people will use it. Whether it be adding new routes, lowering costs for riders, or upgrading stations and stops, there's a lot of ways that we can make our transportation work for people. And one of the best opportunities to invest in these solutions is the Transportation and Climate Initiative. The Transportation and Climate Initiative can help Virginia and other states in the region reduce climate pollution and build a modern, clean, and healthy transportation system. It would also benefit our health, um, potentially avoiding hundreds of premature deaths, asthma systems, and injuries due to traffic incidents. Investing in less polluting and more climate-friendly transportation options could include more electric buses in Virginia to supplement the governor's initiative to use 2 million or 20 million from the Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust um, to reimburse school districts for spending on electric school buses and charging infrastructure. Um, we could take the opportunity to build more protected bike lanes to make it safer for people to bike or walk to the metro. Um, or we could increase bus service in more rural communities of Virginia to connect students or the elderly to essential services, um, such as getting to pharmacies or grocery stores or school. Um, and then for Virginians who continue to rely on a car, we need to 
ensure that those cars are electric. Um, the zero emissions vehicle program requires that automakers sell a percentage of electric cars um, and trucks, making sure that more electric models um, are available for Virginians. Creating an electric vehicle rebate um, will make those cars more affordable while investing in charging infrastructure and requiring new buildings to be EV charging ready will ease the transition to electrification. So more people can afford to have an electric vehicle. Virginia should step up to this next climate challenge that we have and reimagine transportation. We can envision a better carbon-free way to get around and it's a future that we must achieve if we want our state to be a healthy and clean place for generations. So, I just mentioned some of the recommendations that were outlined in our report, um, which we will be sending around to folks after um, this webinar. But we're also joined today by a few people who have been involved in transforming our transportation sector in one way or another um, here in Virginia to talk about opportunities, um, as well as some best lessons from um, what they've already done to set us on a path towards zero carbon transportation moving forward. Um, so first we have, um, our first speaker will be Chris Bast. Um, Chris is the Deputy Director of the Department of Environmental Quality and Co-Chair on the Transportation Climate Initiatives Outreach and Communications Work Group. Um, so I will kick it over to Chris um, now. All right, thank you, Ellie. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you to Environment Virginia for hosting the webinar. Um, first, just on behalf of the governor, I wanna thank everyone for your patience and commitment to keeping yourselves and your fellow Virginians safe during this time. I know it's a very anxious time for many of you and your families. Uh, we continue to find ourselves in uncharted territory here. And, and with that comes a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Um, I know I found uh, comfort in, in both the steady hands of our, our doctor governor uh, and also in the tremendous response of Virginians across the Commonwealth, um, especially those on the, the front lines preparing for and, and fighting the, the virus we're all facing. And you know, part of that response has been Environment Virginia's flexibility and, and rescheduling this event uh, to a webinar. And so um, I appreciate everybody's um, work on that. And, and, and uh, I think we have a pretty robust participation today and I'm, I'm glad to see that. So. Um, I'm excited to be on today to spend some time with you all to discuss some of our work. Uh, as Ellie mentioned, the transportation sector is Virginia's largest source of climate pollution uh, and also of the criteria pollutants like particulate matter and nitrogen oxides, which directly impact public health. This year's legislative session, um, as, as we already discussed, featured pretty historic action on clean energy. Um, following the governor's EO43 from this fall, the legislature passed the 100% clean bill uh, to, to clean up our electricity grid. We also secured passage of enabling legislation to allow Virginia to fully join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, to limit carbon emissions from power plants and, and put a price on those emissions. But for all the time and effort and resources uh, that went into these efforts, uh, which of course are very, very, very important efforts, the climate, the climate community, including state and local governments uh, have been slower to figure out how we reduce pollution from transportation, a sector of our economy that's responsible for roughly twice the amount of greenhouse gases in Virginia than the power sector. And, you know, I think that is reflective of the fact that transportation is a harder nut to crack than electricity. Uh, there are many more sources. Uh, they are less, the sources are less centralized. And uh, indeed, big oil has a stronger and more powerful monopoly over our transportation choices uh, than uh, what we see in the, the power sector. But we have made progress over the past several years. We are massively expanding transit and rail, uh, including um, billions of dollars uh, recently announced investment in uh, our rail infrastructure, uh, in, in new bridge over the Potomac and the expansion of passenger rail service in Virginia. We're investing in electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, and as was said, we're using the diesel gate settlement money to invest in catalytic projects that spur innovation and replace dirty diesel vehicles with clean vehicles across the Commonwealth. But we do need to go farther. Uh, we need to go farther faster to rapidly decarbonize the transportation sector. And you know, I, I really wanna emphasize that this type of report from Environment Virginia is an example of the type of work that we need uh, to identify the pathways to a clean transportation future and more transportation choices for all Virginians. 
The state's role in reducing transportation is to drive policy and invest in solutions. And this report will help us do that. Uh, I do want to mention two ways that we're doing that right now. First is the uh, previously mentioned Transportation and Climate Initiative. This is a really important project that we're working on at the state level uh, with the collaboration of other states in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast region. We're developing a regional policy approach to cap and price climate pollution from transportation and reinvest proceeds into clean transportation choices. This has the potential to be a fairly transformative policy approach that would send a market signal that the era of dirty fuels is over and also spur tremendous innovation across the region. We're very excited about TCI's potential uh, to bring significant economic environmental and public health benefits for Virginia. And one thing I will say about TCI is we have been uh, looking at the modeling, we have been looking at some different policy analysis for how we could uh, use the different uh, tools that come along with TCI, how we could leverage um, the proceeds that would come from uh, this type of program. And it really emphasizes the importance of electric vehicles. I think as you look at this report, you can see that reducing transportation pollution uh, has multiple approaches. Uh, unlike the power sector, it's not just simply a matter of um, shutting down the dirty power plants and replacing them with clean power generation facilities. Uh, it's a matter of you know cleaner vehicles, cleaner fuels, reduced VMT, uh, and, and, and different transportation choices. Um, however, our needs to rapidly decarbonize the transportation system is going to require simply just massive amounts of vehicle replacement. And uh, I know that more cars is not always the solution. In fact, it is not the solution to our transportation problem. Uh, however, replacing the cars we have with electric vehicles, while we also transform the transportation system to one that works better for more people uh, and gets people out of cars, uh, is something that we have to figure out how to balance. The second thing that we're doing uh, speaks to that emphasis on electrifying the transportation system, and that is uh, taking a very um, measured approach to our diesel gate Appendix D settlement funding uh, to really catalyze the electric vehicle uh, community uh, and the electric vehicle economy in Virginia. So we received $93.6 million as part of the Volkswagen emissions cheating scandal. And at the governor's direction, we're investing that money in projects that re directly reduce pollution and, and catalyze the clean transportation economy. So, so far, we've dedicated $14 million to a statewide EV fast charging network. That's a partnership with EVGO that by the time we're done, we'll see roughly 95% of Virginians within 30 minutes uh, or 30 miles, I'm sorry, of a uh, fast charging station. Um, that also includes $14 million to electric transit buses and $20 million to clean school buses, uh, mostly electric with a small carve out for, for those school districts that um, for, for which electric won't work. Uh, and, and we have more to come, uh, many more millions of dollars to come and look forward to making more announcements uh, with that money soon. So I'll stop there and, and just again, many thanks to Environment Virginia for publishing the report. I look forward to working with you all uh, and, and everyone across the Commonwealth to move forward to a clean transportation future together. Great, thank you so much, um, Chris, that was wonderful. Um, again, um, for everyone, we'll be holding questions till the end, so if you have any, please text Ellie or um, you can chat in the um, message um, chalkboard thing. Um, and next we have um, Danny Power, um, the Policy Director for the Virginia Transit Association and the Executive Director of Virginians for High Speed Rail. So we're very excited to have him here with us today and I will hand it over to you. So thank you, Ellie, and uh, thank you again to Environment Virginia uh, for putting on this webinar and releasing the report. I think this is one of the most important issues um, facing our community both here in Virginia and across the United States. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm gonna kind of talk briefly um, and go back and show the positive environmental impact um, that rail and transit has on our communities here in the Commonwealth. Um, and so uh, next slide or first slide. Okay, um, so I represent uh, two organizations, the Virginia Transit Association. Um, that is a group of all our transit agencies and, and associated businesses across Virginia as well as Virginians for High Speed Rail, which is a coalition of citizens and businesses and localities who want better rail service. And combined, um, these two organizations work together 
um, to help work uh, advocate in the General Assembly and before Congress um, to expand more and better rail and passenger rail service. And so, uh, next slide. And so, what I wanted to do for everybody on this webinar um, is I went back um, through the 2018 data to show um, both the environmental impact of our rail and transit and what that means for uh, taking cars off the road. Uh, and so in 2018, Virginia's public transit agencies removed 1.1 billion passenger miles from our roadways, um, which ended up saving us about 14 million gallons of fuel that we did not have to burn um, if those trips were done in a single occupancy vehicle. Um, and what that equates to emissions, carbon pollution, and greenhouse gases uh, is we eliminated the, or reduced um, nearly 130,000 metric tons of carbon pollution, uh, prevented it from being released into our air. Uh, and we took the equivalent, uh, the Virginia equivalent, of nearly uh, 97,000 cars off the road. Uh, Virginians on average drive about 11,400 miles a year. Um, and so that's taking a lot of traffic off the roadways. Uh, our passenger rail, these are our Amtrak trains, both national and um, state sponsored. So if you get on a train in Richmond or Hampton Roads or out in Roanoke, uh, these are the trains that I'm talking about. Uh, they removed about 552 million passenger miles. Um, they saved us about 16, uh, saved uh, about 16.6 .6 million gallons of fuel, uh, prevented the release of about 148,000 uh, metric tons of greenhouse gas and carbon pollution uh, and reduced uh, vehicles on the roadways by about 48, 49,000. And so combined, um, our rail and transit systems uh, have done a pretty good job uh, for the investment levels um, that have been made in those systems. Um, most of the funding uh, here in the Virginia and especially on the federal level uh, goes to roadways. Um, and so uh, obviously we do a lot with very little, um, but that's starting to change. Um, this past General Assembly session, um, the, the historic transportation omnibus uh, was passed for transportation. Uh, rail and transit got the largest percentage of new money of most of the modes. Transit ended up getting about 125 or it's anticipated to get about an additional $125 million a year invested in our transit systems. Um, our rail system is going to get an additional about 30 to $40 million a year. And so that's going to allow us to really start expanding our transit and rail systems heading into the future. Uh, my friend Chris mentioned the Long Bridge. That's a huge project that the governor announced this past December. Uh, that's adding or doubling the capacity of the railroad bridge across the Potomac River connecting Virginia and DC. The original alignment of that bridge goes back all the way to the Civil War, pre-Civil War, um, and it is one of the biggest bottlenecks uh, for rail traffic on the entire East Coast outside of uh, New York City. And so by doubling uh, that capacity and building a new bridge, which will be state-owned, um, which is also historic, Virginia is taking the lead in buying rail corridors because uh, we want to, uh, the Commonwealth wants to control its own transportation destiny moving into the future. Um, that bridge will increase Amtrak service by over 50% and increase uh, Virginia Railway Express, which is our Northern Virginia commuter rail service, by nearly 40%. And so that project alone will remove um, another almost 200 million passenger miles every year by giving commuters additional options, whether they're coming from Richmond or Northern Virginia or uh, the Piedmont. Um, and so all in all, we're making a lot of progress. Uh, the state is investing in some electrified or electric transit up in Alexandria, out in Blacksburg, which is um, one of the most successful systems in the nation, as well as down in Hampton Roads. Um, and so my, my key takeaway about the benefits of rail and transit um, for our environment is that for every $100,000 that the Commonwealth of Virginia invests in expanded transit and passenger rail, we remove about 120,000 passenger miles from our roadways, uh, prevent the burning of about 2,200 gallons of fuel uh, and 43,000 uh, pounds of carbon pollution um, are not released in our air. And so if we wanna get to a carbon zero future, uh, rail and transit have a huge role to play and we look forward to working with Environment Virginia and everyone else on making, uh, turning that into a reality. 
Uh, so thank you very much, and I will pass it back. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Danny. Um, now we will hear from um, Stuart Shorts. Um, Stuart Shorts is the executive director and founder of the foremost smart growth organization in the DC region, Coalition for Smarter Growth. So I'll hand it over to you, Stuart. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, yeah, yeah. we can hear you now. Yeah, it looked like I was muted for a second. Well, uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Go ahead to slide one. Um, and thank you, Ellie, Environment Virginia, Environment America, for this excellent report. Uh, you've done a great job of showing the way forward and that we have the opportunity uh, to make major reductions in our transportation emissions. And uh, out of this comes some great quality of life results as well that I can talk about briefly. Slide two, please. Just a little bit about uh, the Coalition for Smarter, Smarter Growth. We were founded by the region's leading conservation groups way back in 97. We work in the nine major DC area jurisdictions uh, and have been leading the way in shaping where and how our region grows. Our Blueprint for Better Region, which we first released in 2002, it's a vision for a network of walkable, mixed use, mixed income, transit oriented communities. Uh, this is what motivates our work, guides our work, and helped us has really helped us change the debate about growth. And you'll see a small selection of those slides here. I mean, at its heart, we think a lot of the transportation sector problems are a land use problem, and that's what we try to tackle. Uh, the Council of Governments Region Forward Plan adopted in 2010 adopts our vision, and the goal adopted last year by the Council of Governments is that 75% of new jobs and housing uh, in the future in our region must go in transit accessible activity centers. The great thing is that local elected officials have been saying TOD is our future, uh, but I have to admit in a number of these jurisdictions, we just need to all push harder for implementation of transit oriented development and for funding transit walk and bike investments. And I have to say there's still a lot of highway expansion out there that is gonna create challenges for us if we continue that. Slide three. So the Virginia jurisdiction that's been showing the way since the 1970s is Arlington County. And kudos to Jay Fassett, who'll be speaking after me, and all of his predecessors and successors uh, that have made this possible over five decades. This starts from the moment they decided that Metro Rail should go under their aging commercial corridors rather than along highways like I-66. And the upper part, you see the Roslyn Boston corridor out to East Falls Church at the very far left corner. And at the bottom, you see the metro stations in Pentagon City and Crystal City, as well as the airport in the Pentagon. They obviously can't affect those latter two, but they're doing great with the ones they have. The metro corridors are just 11.7% of the county's tax land area, but provide 50% of its property tax base, which benefits everybody in the county. And the 2.5 square miles that are outlined here in the map in the roslyn Boston corridor would actually consume 14 square miles under old auto-dependent suburban patterns. That same amount of development located in outer Fairfax or Loudoun would typically consume that much land. Slide four. Just a quick look here at Roslyn in the 1970s before Metro. Slide five now. So take a look at the Roslyn Metro community um, there in the background and the courthouse Metro community in the, in the foreground. This is from the late 2000s. Even more has been built since these uh, shots were taken. Uh, it's focused in the quarter mile and in some cases up to the half mile. It's filling in in between the two metro stations right now. And in accordance with their plan, they're retaining the nearby walkable tree line neighborhoods. Uh, one thing I should note is this, the benefits of transit line development can happen at a medium density scale and the benefits of walkability and mix of uses can happen at uh, lower density scales as well. It's all about community design. Slide six, please. So Arlington has been a Virginia leader in investing in all the forms of what we used to call alternative transportation, which should be our primary transportation, metro rail, bus, car share, bike share, bike, share, uh, bike lanes, and the road diets that make walking and biking safer. Slide seven. The analysis from uh, the two, early 2000s by Arlington's amazing transportation director, Dennis Leach, uh, shows that transit oriented development works. In the left, you see that 73% of Metro users in the Roslyn-Boston corridors, five stations, are walking to the stations to use Metro. 
just 13% were driving and most of those are being dropped off. But at the stations beyond that, uh, East Falls Church, uh, Dunwaring, uh, Vienna, uh, West Falls Church, at that time when this was done, just 14.6% walked and 57.6% drove. I say at that time, because as a result of our advocacy and that of our partners, Fairfax is pursuing TOD at its five original metro stations and eight new stations along the Silver Line, as well as for planned BRT quarters along Route 1 and Route 7, and we're seeing walk to metro numbers increase. Slide eight, please. The top of this one and looks at, it refers to the, the chart on the right, and it looks at core jurisdictions, which are DC, Arlington, and Alexandria, middle ring, which in Virginia, Northern Virginia includes Fairfax, and outer ring, which is Prince William and Loudoun in Northern Virginia. But this is for the whole COG region. You can see that the, that the sprawled outward, auto-dependent places have longer commutes, higher emissions. And in the outer suburbs, 73% of commuters are driving alone to work. The number is about 64% in Fairfax, but just 37% in Arlington and Alexandria. And this is not just a product of how far out they are, but how the land use is planned. Uh, at the bottom of the chart, it shows that of Arlington residents, 38% of them are commuting by transit. There's a very high percentage walking and biking as well, but the number for transit in Fairfax is 15%. Slide nine, please. Next slide. The Center for Neighborhood Talk Technology based out of Chicago has uh, created uh, some great housing plus transportation maps, which I'm not showing here, but they show the relative cost, vehicle miles traveled, and emissions depending on where you live in, a, in each region of the country. Um, what they found, uh, the metrics that came out of this analysis showed that transportation costs are much higher in Loudoun than they are in Arlington. So were their combined housing plus transportation costs. It's not necessarily more affordable to go farther out. And naturally, vehicle miles traveled are about twice as high as they are in Arlington. Next slide. Uh, in turn, um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, from transportation in Loudoun are twice as high as those in Arlington, almost twice as high. <clears throat> I think we're having trouble getting to the next slide. And now go to the next one. So I'm going to finish with a map of Fairfax County on the left. It'll be too far. One back. Um, in the map of Fairfax County, it's going to be a little fuzzy because of the number of times we've copied and created it. But um, this was part of our effort in as far back as 2008 and before to really try to reshape the future of Fairfax County. Um, you know, uh, one of the challenges we see looking out in the council proje uh, government's projections is Fairfax doesn't change its mode share very much from auto to transit to walk and bike. And these are something called for in the Environment Virginia report that we really need to do. So we have a dedicated organizer for Northern Virginia with a particularly strong focus in uh, Fairfax, Sonia Brihi. Uh, because we need to reshape that future. Just 10% of Fairfax's land can be found in the metro station areas in the red and gray, half mile circles, in the orange areas, which are the VRE stations and the yellow commercial areas. And it's those commercial corridors where we spent a lot of time, including Route 1, to reshape into mixed use walkable transit oriented development. But there are opportunities in Loudoun and Prince William as well, at Loudoun's metro stations and Prince William's VRE stations. So as I conclude, I don't wanna forget um, uh, to acknowledge that tonight we're having a conservation cafe for those in Northern Virginia to see who all your Northern Virginia advocates are from six different groups. And uh, Sonia Brihi from our team will be one of those. Thank you all. All right, thank you so much for that, Stuart. That was great. Um, last up for our speakers, we are joined um, by Jay Bissett. Um, Jay served on the Arlington County Board from 1998 to 2017 and was elected chairman for five terms. Um, during this time, he championed many of Arlington's progressive transportation and land use plans. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Jay. Okay, thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, good. All right. So, yep, 20 years, uh, a lot of involvement, by the way, in regional bodies and statewide groups. So let me first applaud Environment Virginia for the report because I really found it. I liked it. It's clear and it's concise. And my role today is to speak to the local government angle. Um, a lot of my experience is Northern Virginia, so some of it is framed by that, but also trying to speak to the statewide you know, local governments across Virginia. 
Uh, some of it starts with, you know, what are the authorities? If you're in local government, how are you going to take this report and make it work, implement it? And in Virginia, the Dillon rule limits some of the authorities at the local level, so that's not insignificant. We don't have building code authority. We don't uh, really affect, we can't change private electric vehicles. But we do have, at the local level, land use authority. We do uh, make decisions about our own government buildings. We do have complete authority about our public fleets, sedans, transit buses, school buses. And by the way, that authority can change. With the new legislature, they are able to give you some of that authority if you make a good case for it. So let me uh, focus on the three goals presented in this report and work through them and let you know what I think the local government opportunity is. Uh, I'm gonna start with number three uh, in the order they were presented. Doubling the number of people who travel by walking, biking, and public transit by 2035. Great goal. Um, in fact, uh, and local governments do have land use authority. Uh, no one can speak better to this than Stuart Schwartz, who already has spoken, and he gave the whole Arlington gig there. Um, but the truth is, local governments in Northern Virginia have done a fairly good job in this, some better than others. Around the rest of the state, uh, it's a mixed bag. Um, uh, VCN, Virginia Conservation Network, and VTA did a report last year on the status of transit in Virginia, which is quite compelling about what some of the needs are around the state. But it's not good enough to transition to EVs. You need to get more folks walking, biking, and using public transit. Similarly, local governments that do pursue smart growth, that isn't good enough. They are the ones that need to begin to prioritize moving to electric bus and sedan fleets. So at the, on this particular issue, I would rate the local governments anywhere across Virginia from an A to a D. And a lot of that varies across the Commonwealth. On uh, the second one uh, goal put forward in the report, ensuring that all personal vehicles sold after 2035 are electric. Local government rating, I'd give the local governments across the Commonwealth anywhere from a C to an F. Uh, local governments can lead by example through the purchase of fleet sedans. That really is the low hanging fruit. They should be able to lead by example on that very quickly. I believe a few local governments are moving in that direction. Alexandria may be leading the pack. Uh, when it comes to charging infrastructure, and um, they should be able to, uh, through their land use authority, find ways to get all new private, commercial, and residential buildings to embed that, that, that charging infrastructure. I don't believe they're all doing that. Uh, public charging facilities should be, there should be plans underway. Few have done that and little progress is being made, despite the state putting some money forward through the VW money uh, and EVgo to, to get a statewide plan. I think um, no, not nearly enough progress has been made in that regard. Um, and then, so let me go to the third one. And to me, this is the one I wanted to focus on the most, which is electrifying all transit and school buses by 2035. I think this is the big one for local governments. This is where they can and should leave by, lead by example. Um, the technology does exist, uh, but local governments, if I were to rate them across the Commonwealth, and actually, while well, I rate the state and the administration high on the transit side, uh, they are not doing very well on this side either. Um, so local governments really across the Commonwealth and in the greater Washington region, get pretty much an F on this one. Uh, th there are barriers, clearly. Uh, the cost differential for a diesel bus versus an electric. Uh, building that charging infrastructure. And local leaders have limited resources and competing demands. I've been there, I know that. Uh, schools themselves really have to be pulled to focus on this because their focus is on student, students and education and curriculum. Um, the, that said, this issue is a huge opportunity uh, for Dominion, uh, which has had a checkered past, but this is a win-win for the utilities, the electric utility, and the local governments and the community. 
Uh, we also need to build partnerships, uh, not only with the utility, but with the Commonwealth, because the, the local governments really cannot do this on their own. They need some financial assistance. They need planning assistance uh, to help move them in the right direction. Uh, right now, there are 13 major world cities committed to buy only electric vehicles by 2025. Cities like LA, Seattle, Vancouver, Paris, Mexico City, Quito, Auckland, Cape Town, uh, and some cities like Shanghai and Shenzhen in China are only buying electric vehicles, uh, buses, now. So it can be done. So just a few concluding thoughts, just to share a couple more things. Um, I took the, the climate reality training uh, with Al Gore, and I always come back to what he said are the three main elements of reducing greenhouse gases. Three big things. Energy efficiency, renewables into the grid, and electrify transportation. Three big things. Well, at this, I want to speak to the state and the regions because um, the local governments will need help. At the state level, Virginia passed an amazingly comprehensive bill earlier this, this year, the Virginia Clean Economy Act, that was a broad coalition. I had the, the you know, wonderful experience of helping to participate in that. Environmental groups, social equity, clean energy companies through advanced energy economy. That bill passed. That will move this Commonwealth to get its electric grid powered by clean energy by 2045. It also dealt with energy efficiency. So that bill actually took care of the first two of Al Gore's principles. The next General Assembly session will and must focus on the rest, on transportation and the electrification of transportation. Um, there were several bills this session focused on Dominion's uh, EV school bus pilot, which I applaud. It's a great concept and a great vision that all the, the school buses in Virginia uh, become electric within a certain period of time, not that far away. Those bills didn't get over the finish line in Virginia. Not to my knowledge, they did not pass. So it really is important in the next session that the administration and the assembly focus on this issue because local governments will need some assistance and incentive to move this forward, but they have the authority and capacity to do it. Uh, and finally, just a comment on regional transportation bodies. They also have the potential to provide significant support and capacity <clears throat> to make this transition, electrifying the transportation network so to make it come true. We have very advanced, capable regional bodies, whether it's TPB, NBTA, NBTC, the whole you know, alphabet soup of acronyms. There are other groups around the Commonwealth and some new ones coming on board based on the recent omnibus transportation bill passed in Virginia. So um, I think these regional bodies also have a capacity where very little is being done now, for example, at VDOT and the Commonwealth Transportation Board, uh, DRPT, they have not really focused on electrification very seriously. To my view at all, they are looking a lot more at autonomous vehicles than on electrification, but the capacity is there and the opportunity is there. And I hope that this report and next year's General Assembly session and raising the visibility of this issue really get some of our local government leaders um, to do what they really have the authority to do now, they just need some financial assistance and planning assistance to make it happen. That's it for me, thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. Um, it was great for all of our um, presenters, thank you very much. Um, and at this time now, we will um, go into our question and answer section. Um, so again, please um, send these via the chat or you can text Ellie Reynolds um, your question. Um, I'm going to hand over things to Ellie Reynolds, um, again, who is our Clean Cars um, Associate, who has 
been collecting um, those questions throughout. Um, if we don't have time for your question, um, we will follow up and get you an answer afterwards. Um, so I will hand things over to Ellie then. Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Excellent. Well, um, as Ellie mentioned, we'll keep any questions that aren't um, addressed and have speakers follow up after the webinar. Um, so feel free to keep sending them in. We may not get to all of them, but we will follow up. Um, I'll start with one in the chat here from Colin Arnold, and I'll direct this to Ellie Beamer. Um, are there any differences between strategies being applied to personal transportation and commercial vehicle use? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and of course, if there are any of the other um, presenters who want to chime in as well, absolutely feel free to do so. Um, but the way we think about it is personal vehicles, it's all about breaking down the barriers to EV adoption. So lowering the cost, making charging stations more available, um, as well as educating people so that they can learn about how they work. And Whereas commercial vehicles, um, companies really have the opportunity to lead the way there. Um, Amazon, for example, has committed to purchasing 100,000 electric vehicle, um, electric delivery vans. Um, so there is um, those different types of strategies in terms of kind of familiarizing personal vehicle use, but then um, when it comes to more commercial vehicles, um, showing the companies that it is in their best interest to also do this in the same ways that they adopt um, renewable energy um, standards for themselves. Okay, thank you, Ellie. Um, I'm going to move to one for Danny. Um, and I got this in my texts. Um, this person says, India announced 100% of their rail will be run only um, on electricity by 2024. Why did the governor not focus on any new electrification of rail in his announcements? Uh, will Virginia be a leader in electrification of rails to help shift from air travel and internal combustion engine travel? And what is needed? Maybe this is Chris, maybe Danny and I can tag team that uh, a bit. Um, I, I can say that one thing about um, the electric, electrification of rail, it, it's a tremendous strategy. Uh, you know, I think anyone who, is, who has been on Amtrak uh, and has headed north from Virginia, um, has experienced uh, electrified rail when we, when we have the stopover in Union Station to switch the, the engines to the electric engines uh, as, as we move into Amtrak's, um, Amtrak's line in the, in the northeast. You know, the one thing about electrified rail is it's extraordinarily expensive. Uh, and so what we have to do going forward is look at how, how are, what is our strategies for um, rapid uh, decarbonization. And, you know, this is not, I, I mentioned before, um, the importance of um, decarbonizing as quickly as possible while we're also transitioning our transportation system overall. And so what we have to do is have the resources and data available to be able to make those decisions about um, the best sort of emissions reduction bang for the buck. And uh, sometimes there are short-term uh, emissions reductions uh, versus longer term emissions reductions. And we're going to have to be able to balance those. So absolutely, uh, cleaning the entire transportation system is one of the important things that we need to do long term, and that includes electrifying rail. Uh, in the meantime, there are probably um, more efficient uses of the money, of money available uh, to reduce emissions um, quicker uh, and, and to benefit more people. And so that's one of the things that we have to figure out. And, and that also means figuring out how we get more resources to put into this, right? And so again, that's one of the reasons that we're so excited about the Transportation and Climate Initiative, uh, the opportunity to bring um, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars per year uh, in, into the, the state based off of a carbon price, essentially on transportation, uh, could provide us lots of opportunity to invest in a number of different solutions. Hey, Ellie, this is Stuart. I've got some thoughts on rapid decarbonization and things we can individually do as well. Sure, Stuart, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, well, if you think about it, um, you know, Americans move an awful lot and they move frequently. And 
uh, what we saw seen in the last few years is this amazing boom in our cities. I mean, so much so the man was so great that of course it's created affordability challenges. Uh, but you know, when Americans make a decision about where they want to live, they can move pretty quickly. And DC added a thousand people a month for a decade. Um, and each one of those folks drives a lot less than anybody else in the suburbs. So we often think of land use as being slower, but it can be very quick and we can each make individual decisions to make it quicker. We can also give up one of two cars. Uh, we can try you know, and, and use transit, walk and bike more. Um, we can do the things to advocate within our own communities to make it easier to walk and bike for trips and to think individually as we hold that key in our hand, should I turn on that, turn that vehicle on, that non-electric vehicle on, or could I walk for this trip or bike for this trip? So there are things that I think we, we can do very quickly. Okay, thank you so much, Stuart and Chris. I'm gonna move on to another question that we've got because they are building up slowly here. Um, Sue from Electrification Coalition um, is interested in hearing more uh, on state fleet transitions and interest in opportunities to support Maryland, uh, support MD and HD fleet transitions uh, beyond buses. So perhaps if Ellie Beamer and perhaps Jay can weigh in on that. And I just say um, medium duty and heavy duty fleets. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, in terms of um, what our report lays out, um, it really focuses on moving people rather than goods. So we don't really touch on medium and heavy duty in this. Um, but obviously, when we talk about transportation, that is an important component. And we do think that those need to be electric, too. I don't know if other speakers want to expand on that anymore. Well, well, this is Jay. Let me just say that, you know, when you when you think about some of the big equipment that you use in public works, I, I'm that's going to be the last thing to happen. I'm really focused more on school buses and transit buses. The sedans are easy. They should be done now. The school buses and transit buses should be where the, the great focus goes at the moment. And I think Chris spoke to the um, uh, TCI the Transportation Climate Initiative at Georgetown, which is a great thing, and that would provide some potential funds for a whole range of, of transit expenses and incentives. And really, you're talking here for local governments about the delta between the cost of a diesel bus and an electric bus. And then, you know, that's going to come down as more people buy them and the orders come in, but it's also the possibility that the, 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 somebody else can, can lease the battery, which is the big differential in cost. So some of those options I believe are out there now too. So if you lease the battery versus buy the battery, then you're essentially paying that lease cost with your saved maintenance cost over each of the ensuing years. Um, you also have in Virginia, you know, the transportation bill went through this year. It put some more money in for transportation trying to replace the lost fuel costs um, with an increase in the gas tax over a couple of years. Um, but you do have CTB uh, has access to funds. Um, NVTA the, and, and there'll be regional bodies in other parts of the state too, Richmond, uh, Tidewater, they have regional funds that hopefully can be used. Sometimes it's hard getting money for capital expenditures from, uh, from these sources. And so you have to think about how you can incentivize or, or allow the use of that money, some of those existing monies for capital as opposed to only, um, uh, excuse me, it is usually for capital, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, so in my view, some of the existing regional and state bodies need to start thinking about electrification and getting plans together that allow them to integrate these potential costs and expenditures into their ongoing work, as well as the potential for TCI to generate new. All right, thank you so much, Jay. I think we'll do maybe one or two more questions. Um, we will start with Audubon Naturalist Society's first question here. Um, they are hosting a conservation cafe tonight, as Stuart mentioned. Um, the first one, I'll direct this to Stuart. Uh, typically, people move further away because that's where people can afford. What strategies have you backed to ensure that the transit-oriented development also comes with the ability for all to take advantage of it? 
Well, that's one of the reasons why I posted uh, the Center for ne Neighborhood Technologies uh, information because they uh, encourage all Americans to look at the combined housing plus transportation costs. And while you can deduct your mortgage, uh, if you own own a, a property, you can't deduct those a lot of those transportation costs. Not most people can't, and those transportation costs can add up and reduce the affordability of living farther out. That said, there's so much demand to live in walkable transit-oriented communities that we've seen prices going up. One of the things we think is really critical for TCI and the equity side of TCI uh, and how we spend the revenues from that. Not only should it go to transit and a special transit operating dollars. Uh, it should go potentially to zero fares, to certainly more affordable fares, and in terms of housing, it should go to affordable housing close to transit and jobs. And um, that way we'll achieve some equity. And I would say uh, that instead of massive highway projects and $100 million interchanges, think about $100 million instead spent in terms in affordable housing near transit. Um, that will give you more bang for the buck across so many different sectors. It not only will improve the functioning of our transportation network and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it will uh, give someone a roof over their head, uh, increase their chances of success in life and their kids' success in life. Okay, thank you so much, Stuart. I think we'll take the last couple minutes here just to do one more, and I'm picking this one out of the letter because I like to I liked it the best. What can we do now from home to organize and advocate for our state and local governments to do more? Um, I think we'll start with Ellie Beamer, but hopefully if everyone can weigh in. Yeah, um, I think that there's quite a bit that we can do. We've heard a lot about different opportunities and I think um, that we have, in terms of dealing with transportation, there's so many levels of government that we do need to work through and so I think the first step is letting you letting your representatives know that you want um, them to prioritize decarbonizing our transportation through adopting electric vehicle fleets or making it easier for you to walk or take the bus to get where you need to go. Um, there's also, um, I mean, as an environment Virginia are working on this, so of course follow us. Um, the Clean car rollback is expected soon, so there will definitely be upcoming opportunities um, to respond um, to the Trump administration's um, move on this. Um, and I'll let the other speakers, if they have other things to add as well. This is Stuart. I mean, you've emphasized what you can do now from home since we're all at home. And I think the first thing that's going to happen at the local level and the very near term thing is the impact of this crisis on local budgets. So the, now's the time to weigh in on what the most important priority should be. And, you know, in the, and obviously social services and the social safety net has to be critical. Uh, we cannot leave people homeless and without access to, to income for, for their household. So I think there will be a lot of focus there. Um, that can include um, affordable housing, um, uh, rent vouchers, things like that, uh, support for that. In transit, it's going to be operating dollars. We really need operating dollars. And I hate to say it, for a year, we may be delaying some transit capital projects and have to make sure we are providing the operating service we need. At the state level, same thing. We've got to put transit first in our future funding. We need more funding for affordable housing uh, go going forward. And I think the state needs to look at all of its infrastructure subsidies, whether it's in schools, um, or, or other infrastructure services, including economic development, the Go Virginia program, all of that has to be tied back to smart growth, more sustainable, compact development to reduce all of our infrastructure costs and our greenhouse gas emissions. I've got a few things to add. This is Chris again um, on this. Uh, first off, to, to paraphrase uh, something which I think was attributed to, to Franklin Roosevelt, but I might be wrong. It's, um, you know, I. I think he said to, to labor organizers at one point, I agree with you, now go make me do it. And um, I say that when it comes to your state government, uh, know that um, you know climate change is uh, one of this administration's top priorities. Uh, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not important for you to continue to have your voice heard. So you know, contacting the governor's office, contacting the legislature, uh, even legislators who, you know, agree with you, it's important to continue to give them the feedback that we need to go farther faster. Uh, so specifically on the transportation and climate initiative, uh, if that is something that you support, 
uh, if that is something that you think there are ways that we could do it better, continue to, to raise your voice and contact the governor's office and, and the General Assembly. Uh, your local governments, it, uh, on, on TCI, it's important to have local government support. So all of those things are important things that you can do to make sure that we are continuing to move forward um, at a pace that responds to the urgency of the challenge. Uh, and, and I'd also add on the affordable housing piece, affordable housing is a climate strategy. Um, you know, public health is a climate strategy. Clean transportation is a climate strategy. Uh, density is a climate strategy. Uh, you know, this is the ultimate silo breaking issue. So continue to think about it in that way. And then lastly, what I try to leave every, uh, every conversation I have about this with groups of folks is um, going back to where transportation ranks amongst our carbon footprint. Um, you know, if you are considering if you are fortunate enough to be in a situation where you are considering putting solar panels on your house, I would just recommend that you pause and get an EV instead. Uh, if you can do both, great. But if you have to choose between one, uh, replace your gas vehicle with an electric vehicle. Uh, you will drive down emissions per dollar spent uh, much faster, much more significantly, and improve the, the local health of your community at the same time. So um, let's think about that and uh, keep keep on pushing us. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think we don't have any more time left to hear some other opportunities, but we will um, compile some of the best ones we can think of when we send out um, an email to all of you after this um, with our contact information, which is on this last slide, as well as a copy of the report. Um, we will also, of course, follow up on the questions. There are tons of really, really great questions in there that we weren't able to get to. Um, but we will follow up with you all um, after this as well. But thank you again, everyone, for getting on today. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Please um, stay healthy and safe out there, um, and we can all get through this whole crazy world together. Um, but thank you again. Um, have a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone.